Now, I, I have no idea what's wrong with the, um, with the lighting system. It appears our, um, our technique is no longer working, right? I was, I was trying to switch the lights off, I couldn't. But, uh, I forgot this. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see. Well, I mean, I don't know what we're going to do now. I, I tried to... Oh, it's working now. It wasn't working when I came in. Ah, much better. And that was stone. Yeah? So this is stone. Okay, so we continue our conversation or discussion of uh, MIPS instructions and hopefully we hopefully we we will um, finalize um, we finalize this lecture series today uh, oh. I hope we will finalize things today, don't know. Um, but before we start, right, a um, few announcements. Ah, so it's... So there are probably people that came to see me last Friday. Unfortunately, I wasn't around. Uh, I, was, I was on the other side of campus. Um, school of veterinary medicine or something. I got stuck somewhere, and it's like, which is why he couldn't find me. And I foolishly only sent through uh, an apology email to, I left out your mailing list in that apology, right? Telling people tells you're going to be around, which is why you bounced, I suppose. So I apologize if you still need to come and see me, I'll be around this Friday, unless otherwise. Um, and then a reminder that in terms of scheduled ass assessments, we have a, a quiz, quiz number 17, um, on Friday, seven hours. Um, everything covered up to loops, right? And then it's become apparent here that class theory test number four, um, it's not going to be possible for us to have class theory test number four on the 4th of October, and so we shall have this on October 11th, right? Which is very soon. Um, and something else that's become apparent is that we, we really won't be able to, to finish off uh, the next lecture series in good time for us to be able to write content based on that lecture series in the test itself. So the test will only include uh, content from essentially just MIPS instruction set. Um, right, one, two, and three. So lecture series number 19, number 21, and number 22. I said possibly 23 here, but I don't think we'll be able to do this in good time. So it'll just be based on these three lecture series, which is really, it's very little content, right? I, again, I apologize that we won't be able to include uh, content from lecture series number 23. Okay, <coughs> you'll probably want to study for this. You know? Goes without saying. Yes. I mean the well, quiz seventeen. It, for instance, it will not include what we're discussing today. It will, it will only be based on content covered until last Friday. These loops. This is what I mean. Okay, so we continue our conversation, and, and hope the people had a chance to look at uh, uh, or to revise or review the the examples that we discussed in class. Specifically, the three examples, I mean, we, we, we went through a lot of trouble trying to uh, explain what was happening behind the scenes here. So specifically, I'm referring to the, um, the uh, count even numbers program, the, uh, um, the program that checks if a number is a prime number or not, um, and then the program that um, 
it adds even numbers within a specified range, right? It, really, the idea is you want to go through those things so that you understand exactly how loops work. Um, I wish there was a button that says go to today's slide or something, right? Or go to slide number, specify the number, but unfortunately I have to click forward. I should have done that using my machine. All right. Oh, and then I don't know how many people tried to implement the fees buzz, which is quite nice. Fees buzz, right? One, two, three. Fees, right? No? No one? Ah, thank you, Mr. Kevin. Kevin Costa, right? Uh, it works just fine? Okay. It's good. Would, would love to, to see the implementation after class then. Uh, anybody else try out the fuse buzz? Nobody bothered. Ah, did it work? Okay, <laughs> should see that. I, thank you very much. At least two out of uh, <laughs> 65 is good. I think it's better than nothing, right? All right, so I guess the, the last bit that we're talking about here is just procedures, right? Um, uh, in, in, in so far as like code fragments are concerned, really, when you're discussing programming languages, these are basic um, programming constructs that you get to to discuss or look at in depth. All right, so procedures, otherwise called functions, in certain certain circles, they're called methods, right? Uh, it's one and the same thing, um, and nothing more than code fragments that are used to represent a sequence of instructions that are frequently used. Right, so there are usually instances where you get to repeat a sequence of instructions. And so the idea behind procedures is uh, why not factor out that functionality and then just encapsulate it in one unified location. And then you just refer to that code fragment from within the program. Right, um, right and so this, this, uh, this kind of like screen grab on the, on the right here is just uh, showcasing typical examples that you probably are familiar with, right? Um, like if, if you saw, if, if you saw, if it so happens that you find yourself implementing, let's say two branches, uh, almost always the case that you need to gracefully exit the program at the end of the branch itself, the branch label, right? Each of the individual branch labels, right? So you typically have uh, code fragments here for gracefully exiting, specifically li uh, v0 comma uh, 10, and then Cisco. Right, and you notice that the, the code fragments that you need to place in line number 15, in line number 11, and in line number 19 are the same. Right, and so the idea here is to just, uh, you know, just factor these, these common code fragments out and then just uh, have them or place them in one, one location within, within your program itself. And then you just refer to the, um, to the code fragments for exiting in this case. Right, and so the, the question obviously is, but why would you want to bother doing this, right? Um, the, the, obvious, the obvious answer here is you get, to, you get to avoid repetition, right? So you, you end up writing something like this or like that just once, and then you refer to it. And you realize that once you do this, um, it becomes a lot easier for you to avoid errors, because if if there's an error associated with this particular code fragment, you only have to fix one location within your program. Right? Plus, it makes your program more readable as well. Right? Um, and, and, and really, this is, this is so common, even more so now, because uh, I guess computer software has become so very sophisticated, right? And this is probably a very rudimentary example here, but people rarely write programs where you implement um, login functionality from scratch. Why? Because people already did that, so all you have to do is you, re you reuse that uh, particular code fragment. There is no reason why I should, if I'm, if I'm writing an application that is specific to mathematics or to maths, 
there is absolutely no reason why I should re-implement functionality for computing the square root of a number. People already did that years ago. All I have to do is just reuse that code fragment of functionality, right? Um, just to showcase here using uh, your typical, your typical um, high-level programming language, again, I'm just using Python here. Um, if I'm writing, I don't know if people can see, if I'm writing, uh, like again, math-specific function, for instance, all I have to do is tell Python that I want to import a package that has the functions specific to maths. And all I do is I call the functions, like so. <laughs> They're all here, right? Function to compute the ceiling of a number, a cosine for a number, you know, function to compute the factorial for a number, the flow, you know, the square root for a number. So all I have to do is just tell, tell this particular programming language to say, you know what, I want to call the function that computes the square root and I want to compute the square root of 100, right? And the, 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 the interesting thing about, um, about procedures or functions for the most part is that you, you rarely need to know the gory details of um, how that particular function was implemented. The only information you need from whoever implemented this function is what is the name of the function? How do I use the function? What do I get back when I call the function? So for instance, the square root function. I know the name of the square root function is SQRT. And I know that it takes in one parameter, which is the number that, uh, whose square root I want to compute. I don't care how, well, I haven't bothered, and maybe you should care, but I don't care how it was implemented. And I don't care whether it's 1,000 lines of code. All I care about is that I can use that function and it gives me the result I want, right? Another example is uh, these so-called system calls that we've been using. It's like a black box. Someone just tells you to say, for you to exit, you must load the register, I mean the number 10 into register V0, and then issue Cisco, and then you'll be able to gracefully exit. Someone wrote down the code that does that. It's integrated within Qt Spin, but somebody wrote the code that does that. For you to access or to make use of that particular service, all you need to know is how you use it and what happens when you use it. That's all, right? Um, so hopefully that, that kind of like provides good enough motivation for why functions are, um, are important or useful, right? You're avoiding repetition, your code is more readable, uh, you, you are less likely to run into errors. If there's a change to be made, you only have to make that change once. Imagine a scenario where you have a code fragment with 1,000 lines and then you are maybe, uh, you, you, you have um, code fragments that adds numbers, right? And you realize, say, oh, my implementation of adding two numbers is wrong. Uh, and so happens that the adding of numbers is done, maybe you, you have it in 10, 10 different places in that particular source code. What you'd have to do is you make changes 10 times but if you use procedures, it's just one place because you'd have factored the functionality of that particular, uh, or you'd have factored the functionality of the program by making use of a procedure. Okay, so in terms of how these things work in, in MIPS, uh, pretty easy really. Um, so the first thing you need to do, right, for you to implement a procedure in MIPS is you must define the procedure. When you specify, you give it a name, obviously the definition involves you giving it a name. Why does it need a name? Because for you to make reference to the procedure, you need to use the name, right? So you give it a name by using, lo and behold, the label, right? So this is a user-defined name, it could be anything, it could be X, it could be Y, um, always a good idea to use more descriptive names, right? Um, and then, uh, obviously, after the label, you have the Full colon, the usual drill, a label is always followed by a full colon. Um, and then you come up with implementation of that particular method. And then, by convention, at least it's the rules, not the conventions really, the other rules anyway, you must have uh, this particular instruction at the end of the procedure itself. Right, so jump register and then you have dollar sign RA. Um, RA happens to be RA happens to be register number 31 for those that care, right? Uh, you'll find it here. Here, right? Um, this is register number 31. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so J is just a jump to register RA. It's just jump register RA. Sorry? Sorry? No, oh, 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 I'm going to describe just now. What, what's happening behind the scenes is uh, the way jump and leak works actually is that you, you, um, Once the CPU comes across jump and link, the first thing it does is it, it copies the next instruction to be executed into the register RA or register 31. Right, so what you're doing when you have JRA is essentially you're saying wherever you have a, a procedure, a procedure, right, uh, and you have a, uh, uh, return address here. Um, and you have this, what, what you're telling, what, what the CPU will do is you say, oh, this guy wants me to go to RA. But RA is the next instruction to execute. And so effectively what you're doing is you are going to the next instruction that follows the definition of the procedure. Right? So it's just, this is what's happening here. Need to replace my batteries here, I guess. I don't know if I'm too far away. Okay, so this is what I was saying. So what jump and link does essentially, uh, JAL, is um, it copies the address of the next instruction into the register RA, right, and then jumps to the label, so it goes to the label. So it's like jump and link. So jump to the label and then uh, copy the contents of the next instruction to be executed into RA. And we know where the next instruction, the address of the next instruction is coming from. PC, program counter, yes. Information overload. Uh, the idea makes, <coughs> I was trying to keep, keep up with what you were saying. What you're saying does make sense, but I think it would make even more sense if we actually saw the actual implementation of what you're saying. But ideally, yeah. So, for, so I was able to pick out one thing, one key thing from what you just said. The fact that, um, the fact that you are, you are implementing a procedure to print, that's what you're doing. So yes. So you're saying within that loop, you, you essentially issue jump and link, and then you link to the procedure that prints the number. Yeah. That would work because once you see jump and link, you will go to the definition of the procedure. Once you execute the procedure, effectively printing, you execute the next instruction that follows the jump and link statement or instruction. Yeah. Okay, so it's quite important really here, is, and, and I hope you're keeping your try, your, you remember the things we've discussed in the past. The next instruction to execute, program counter, right? All right, so again, just showcasing like code fragments that would, would have the same things here, right? Same contents and how you go about doing that. Um, so for something like this, you notice that all you'd have to do is, uh, instead of defining or writing the series of instructions for exiting, all you do is you say, I have a definition for an exit procedure, lines number 31, 32, 32, here. This is my definition for exiting. And then all I do is, once I define the procedure, I refer to the procedure at the point when I wish to exit. So in this case, in this label, as the last statement, instead of uh, doing what we're doing by either writing LI, V0, comma 10, and then Cisco, 
for the unconditional branch, what we could do as an option is we just say jump and link to exit. Exit this time around is, is not just like a, a, any other normal label, right? But it's a procedure. And how do you define the procedure? Instructions for performing the task we wish to perform, followed by as the last statement, the instruction JR space dollar sign RA. Mm. Rules, those are the rules. Um, so line number 17, um, I'm calling the procedure exit. Line number 23, I'm calling the procedure exit. Right. Once I call it, boom, I come here and I exit. Right. You notice we can pretty much do the same thing here for uh, other common code fragments, right? If you if you pay particular attention to what's happening in uh, in these two labels, right? The, less than label and the greater than label. So lines number 13 all the way up to 17 and line number 19 all the way up to 23, you will notice that we are doing the same things in line number 16 and 22. So why not just define a procedure that will print a string? And then in all instances where we wish to print a string, all we do is we issue jump and link, jump and link, jump and link. Um, of course, this is a somewhat special case because what we have to do before uh, calling uh, jump and link is we have to load the address of the string that we wish to print, right? Effectively, we are providing the argument for this particular uh, procedure. Is this making sense? Yes. Yes. Well, it's like jump register, go to this. Yeah. Execute, uh, it's, it's like you're saying, um, it's, it's like you're saying, divert program flow to the instruction that's located here. And why does that happen? It's, it's, the thing that initiates execution of the procedure is the statement or the instruction JAL, jump and link. Behind the scenes, the way jump and link works is it copies the address of the next instruction to be executed. So if we were, we are here, we are here. We execute line number 15. And then we come to line number 16. Jump and link. Copy the address of the next instruction. Effectively, it will be the address of the next instruction is this thing here. Copy it into RA. And then go and execute the code fragments associated with the procedure that I'm linking to, which is print message. So I'll go to print message and then run all of this. Effectively, you're saying print the string. After you print the string, once you execute JR, uh, uh, jump register RA, you're saying divert program flow to this address, which is effectively this um, line there. So it's, it's, like, uh, it's like you're continuing off from where you stopped, right? It's like you're stopping to execute code associated with this. Afterwards, you come back and start executing from the next line, which is the next instruction. Jump and Really the, the, the thing to, to kind of understand here, the takeaway point is what's happening when you use JAL, jump and link, and also uh, what happens when you see jump register RA, right? Is this fine? Requires a bit of imagination and also uh, a lot of practice. But I, I don't know if people practice here, they don't want to practice. Have we done prime numbers? No, we haven't, why not? We are too busy writing EU 1010. Um, I hope it was fine. So here's a simple example, right? Let's say I decided to use a completely different example, an example that we've covered before. Let's say we are, we, we are asked to write an assembly language program that prompts a user to enter two integers, right? So you enter maybe zero and one or negative one and two. And if the first number is, is less than the second number, what you do is you print first number is less than second. If the second number is less than the first number, you print second number is less than first. 
Very simple thing. Question is, how do we go about implementing this? You notice that using the, don't know if people can see here. Can you? No. Don't know what you just said there, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the people can't, that can't. Is this good enough? So, so if we were to, to, to use our normal implementation, right? Um, I hope this thing is record, recording. If we were to, to use our normal implementation of coming up with a program that just compares two numbers, you notice that it's a very trivial thing here. We start off with, uh, with, um, with a data section where we specify, we, we prompt a user because we need to prompt a user to enter the two numbers. So we prompt a user to enter number one, we prompt a user to enter number two. Right, um, and then we need to define as part of the data section also the strings, the two strings that are going to be printed once we execute our code. So if the first number is less than the second number, then we wish to essentially print this string here in line number five. Right. Otherwise, we shall print the line, uh, the, the 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 string in line number six here. Right. Again, uh, in the main method here, this is second nature. What we do is the first thing we do is we say we're going to prompt the user, which is why we're printing first number here, right? So essentially we're saying we shall, we shall print this text here. Enter first number, right? After the user enters, uh, well, we print that string, we read input from the user an integer because the user is supposed to enter the integer, which is why we're using system call code number five here, between line number 15 and 16. Afterwards, what do we do? We're saying move, because we know that once the user enters the integer, let's say I type in two, that number will be in V0, so we shall copy, and then number 18, we shall copy what is in V0, the value the user has specified into register eight. And then we prompt the user for the second number. The prompt is the same as what we've done before. What do we do? We say print the text associated with var second number. Essentially, we're saying, print this, enter second number. Once the user uh, sees that piece of text, or once we print out that piece of text, we say in line number 24 and 25, we say read the second number from the user, which is why we're using system call code five, right? Once we read the value the user types in the second number, we must move it to a safe register. Right? So the value that the user has entered is in V0, move it to nine. <laughs> and then what we're doing in line number 29 and 30 is we're saying, if the first number the user has entered is less than the second number, branch two, the branch named first less than label, right? Effectively, we're gonna go here and just print that piece of text that says first number is less than second number, or first less than second, nobody cares, right? But if this is not executed, if it so happens that eight is greater than nine, like if the user enters five and then they enter zero, then we know that this line here CPU will come here and check, oh, well, but eight is not, is, is not less than nine, so what I'll do is I'll just continue the next instruction. Comes here and discovers, oh, the second number is less than the first number, and so I shall branch to second less than label, right? It's line number 42 all the way up to 48. Which point I just print second number is less than first. Right? But you will notice something very peculiar here. What we are doing in line number 11 up to 13 is the same as what we are doing in line number 20 up to 22. Hmm? Sorry? Since the sequence is repeating, yeah, yes. the sequence is repeating, would we have to use the interpolate so that it don't repeat the sequence? Yes, that's, that's the motivation here, actually. Saying, instead of us doing this, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, uh, I'm exiting, why don't I just use a procedure, write a procedure that just prints a string for me and replace this with the jump and link to the name of the procedure, right? Same thing for exit, I suppose. Uh, instead of, alternatively, instead of saying, 
using this unconditional branch to say B and then exit label, we can just convert this code fragment into a procedure. And then wherever we have B space exit label, we shall have jump and link exit label, whatever a, a procedure name we come up with. So as long as you have one of the procedures, that's all that matters, that you have one of the procedures, let's say that the instructions of the less than must at least be there, and the instructions of the exit label yes. must, must be there rather than us repeating them. Each time we want to execute that program, we go to jump and link then to be executed from the instructions that we already have. Yes, that is the motivation. This is a huge takeaway. Imagine a situation where you have a, a program, right? That has 1,000 lines of code and you're redoing these things over and over again. And again, I'll take you back to this high level thing I was talking about here, right? It's, it, what else is there? There's so, there so many things that are common. Like if I want to compute, oh, what's the power, or what's five raised to the power two, or two raised to the power five? I can do this. I can do this in a high-level programming language because there's already code fragments that exist for me to do this. So I don't have to redo this over and over again. This is a power reading really of procedures. But uh, I digress. Uh, we're not here to talk about uh, inbuilt functions in Python. The, the, the use, the potential use case for this is limitless, right? Especially once you start uh, web programming, hopefully is it third year or something? I don't know. Um, you realize that. Uh, you know, uh, designing your programs in this way results in very effective code. Because you don't have to redo things that have already been done. You implement some cool function, all you have to do is ship it, ship it to your classmates and say, I have implemented this, you can use this, this is how you go about using it. If this was not possible, you'd have to implement uh, how to gracefully exit from scratch. Go figure. Okay. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, before you proceed, uh, we talked about the previous program that you're facing. Why? I didn't get what you said why you were putting full columns on the first statement and the first. When? The previous program that you're facing. This. Why? After interface name. Yeah, the full column. I didn't get what you said why the full column. I mean, this is just a, usually when you're writing an interactive program, visually the user will know that, you know, when you have a full column, the user knows subconsciously, say, I must provide input. It's like, you can, you can do this if you want. I don't know if you've seen this in programs. This. Yeah. Just like when I'm using my, this interpreter here in Python, it's the same thing. Why do, does it have uh, three greater than signs? It's just uh, to showcase that, uh, you know, this is like an interactive sort of application, and so it's expecting input. So in a put so does it mean that the computer is supposed to think that it's a level? No, 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 no. This is just, it has nothing to do with that. You might as well just remove it then, number. It has nothing to do with that. It's, it's just uh, anything that appears in, in, in courts, in most programming languages, uh, MIPS is no exception. It's stuff that is user-defined. So the, the CPU or the QGIS will print it verbatim, the way it is. Right. I don't know why they are running away now. Is it, uh, today's class is boring. Hey. I've noticed something. They're already. Line number 11. Yeah, compared to the other one. OK. Yeah, which are the JRR. Which, no, there's no JRR here yet. For what? For what? The other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so here's the thing, right? We had this, um, we are saying we have this, we have this problem. The normal way in which we've been implementing or trying to provide a solution to this problem is this, which is, which is effectively what we are looking at here. This is the normal way we've been doing it, but we're saying there's a better way. And the better way is it involves using procedures, which is why the stuff that comes after has uh, the jump and link and the JR. Yeah, so you don't tell the system that, because you want to print a string, you don't like call system in code number four, but you just load the string into a register. No, no, you do though. You do that within the procedure, and I'll showcase just now an example. Yes? So it's like we make a procedure, then we label it, and then we use that label. 
Yes. Yes. Can there be like with the other, with the, the way we used to do it? Can we not the string, mm. then call the 16 call number 4? Can we do it the other way around, like twice? No, no, I don't think I get what you're saying. How? <laughs> I'm laughing because for people, he's written it down and he wants me to read it. No, can I read that afterwards? Okay. Uh, I'll read it. Let's chat afterwards. I mean, hopefully, it will make sense by the time we are done here. Yeah, I think it will. So, so here's the thing, right? You notice that there's a, there's a possibility of us kind of factoring out common functionality. No, notice that this code fragment, this code fragment, this code fragment, this code fragment is just the same. We're printing the string here. So we are saying, why can we not just implement a procedure that does this, just as an example, right? Um, so a procedure will just print strings. Something else, that, yes, sir? Why don't we add like, everything, including the logical media, and this is your device? Why don't we? Like, after those common fragments that we have, yes. we also have like, the two common fragments. This? Yeah, the one. <laughs> uh, you could, I guess. You could. Yes, you could make a procedure that's, that, that kind of reads an integer. So you have jump and link read integers, your procedure. You can. I'm just using two examples here where we are printing a string and also exiting the label. But you can. Nice catch. What, what he's asking is that. Because code common fragments here between lines number, in line number 24, 25, and uh, is it 15 and, I don't know, 16 or something, these are the same? Why, why can we not do the same thing we are doing here? Yes, we can. Okay, so, but in this example, just looking at printing a string and exiting as well. So we can convert these three code fragments here into, we can encapsulate the code here into a procedure, right? Um, Right, so uh, effectively what you'd be doing is in all these uh, labeled parts here, you'd just have jump and leak statements linking to the name of the procedure applicable to the code fragment. So in this case, the procedure for printing the string, in this case, the procedure for exiting. Right, yeah. Yes? How many procedures can be presented by jump and leak? It's one. You jump, the format of the instruction is jump and link the name of the label, which is the label address. So it's just one. So you can only link to one address. Uh, I mean, one, one label, one procedure. Which makes sense, actually. Yes? Is it one label at a time, or one label in the entire system? No, at a time. You see, you can write a very long program, complex program, that has maybe 10,000 lines of code. And within that, those 10,000 lines of code, it's highly likely that you might have maybe 50 procedures doing different things. <laughs> You can have 50 jump and links, and 50 or more jump and links, referring to those 50 procedures you'd have defined. Right, so an example of uh, the, the, so what we've done is, uh, we're saying this part here, this part, this part, and this part, we're gonna convert them into what we are seeing in line number, in line number 42 up to 45. And I'll just switch to, if we go to line number 42 up to 45, you notice that we have uh, this code snippet here where all we are saying is, uh, all we are saying in 42 to, to 45 is we are going to uh, make use of system call code number four and then um, uh, issue this call here and then jump registers to I. You notice something very peculiar here, right? The, there's a part that's missing. Because when you're invoking a procedure, sometimes if it takes an argument, you have to specify an argument to the procedure. You, you're doing this when you're invoking it, which is why, observe, in parts where we are invoking jump and link print string procedure, we have, right before that, we have the load address into A0. So we are loading the address of the string we wish to print into A0, and then we evoke the procedure. And this, is, this is why, this is what makes uh, implementation of print, print string procedure flexible, I guess. Is this, is this making sense? 
so so you notice yes Yes. What usually happens is you start first by loading instructions or whatever terms, for example, the number four. Uh huh. Right. Right. And then that's when we bring about now the loading of the address. So, how do you see that in the other example, it's like the other way around? First load the address in both the code. Because you see, when, when, when this, and, and I'll, I'll use this because it's the same thing anyway. This is more, more readable, I guess. If you look at what's happening in line number 25 to 28, <clears throat> you, you only get to, you only get to transfer, program flow only comes to line number, number 25 when you issue jump and link print message in this case. When you issue In this example, when you, you have the instruction jump and link print message. Bear with me, the name of the procedure here is different from what we have in the other source code, but it's the same thing, it does the same thing, right? Um, what happens in line number 16, right? Forget about line number 15, line number 16, once CPU sees JAL print message, program flow will go to print message. When you go to print message, when you start executing these instructions line by line under print message, CPU will see, oh, uh, load value four into V0, that's fine. And then this guy says Cisco. The moment it says Cisco, it knows that I must check what is in V0 to figure out the service that the user wishes to request. At which point it knows this person wants to print a string. When it knows that the person wants to print a string, it will only be able to print the string once it finds the address of that string in register A0, which is why we must specify A0 before we, we call or invoke print message. So by, by the time it's evoking it, at this point, right, uh, once you issue this call, uh, A0 will be, will be the value of the address of string one. Uh, and this is important because you want to use print message in various portions of your program. When you're evoking print message in line number 22, it's a different type of string you're printing out, which is why you need to specify the address of that particular string prior to evoking jump and link, right? It's like cable burning or something, I don't know. I hope it's not my machine or something else. Someone is smoking in class. Is this making sense? <laughs> Guys, the understanding procedures is not that hard if you just figure out, if you understand what jump and link does and what, what, what the instruction JR space dollar sign RA does. That is all you need to know for procedures. That is all. Yes? Mm. No, I, I don't think I get what you're saying here. Uh, like, go back to the, to the other, like, the, this? Yeah, that one. The, the jump and... Is this good enough? Yeah, yeah, we have like the, the, the Lord address, that thing, whatever. Which, um, which line number are you referring to? 15 comes before 16, right? Yes. Could it be because if line 15 came after 16, it would make the code complicated because... Not complicated, it would be like you'd have a logical error because you see, if you, if you move line number 15 after line number 16, the first thing you, you do is you, you execute jump and link print message. Once program flow comes to print message, this thing will, will realize to say print message uh, involves calling or using system call code number four, which is printing a string. Once the moment the syscall operation is executed, CPU, CPU, QTSPM will check, MIPS will check if, it will check the register address in A0, but because you've moved it after, there will be nothing in there. 
Hmm? Yeah. There'll be nothing. So you want to make sure that you see, it's it's like uh, it's like me, and I'm taking you back to something that makes more sense. I have a, I have a a function that that takes in a square root of a number, right? What I have to do here is I have to provide I have to provide um, the argument, the number whose square root I want to I want to evaluate, right? So square root of 100 is 10, for instance. What you're suggesting is, uh, well, I could just as well say a is equal to 100, right? And then math dot square root of a, for instance. What you're suggesting is you say uh, you want to evaluate the square root of b, right? But you will say math dot square root b, and then you define b afterwards. This won't work because it doesn't work anywhere because b does not exist at this point in time. So b must exist before you use b. So 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 if we come back here, right? Um, we must make sure that the string whose address we wish to print has been defined, has been specif specified. The address for that string has been specified before we say print the string, and not the other way around where you say, oh, print the string and then specify the address. No, it's, it's, all, it's all because of how execution of, of these instructions is done one line at a time, right? It's sequential unless if you explicitly divert program flow somewhere. Is this making sense? That's a good question, thank you. Okay, so you notice that uh, now, now we've got into a stage where exit label, you can do the same thing here. Um, and really, effectively, what you end up with is a sort of scenario situation where, boom, you have, you have procedures, implement, uh, procedures specified or defined between lines number 42 and 45 for the print string procedure, right? The procedure just prints a string Right, whose address is somewhere in memory in RAM. Another procedure that exits gracefully. Right, um, the difference between these two procedures, I'm sure people have noticed here, is that the other one expects an argument. You must specify a value for the procedure to work. The other one does not. So exiting doesn't require you to specify any value, right? But printing a string requires you to specify the address of the string you wish to print. Right, so it's a, it's a simple thing here. Hi. Mm. In simpler terms, what you are saying every time you say jump ready or JR dollar sign RA is you're saying go and execute the instruction that follows the JAL or the jump and link instruction that you executed before. So in this case, when you say in line number 39, JAL, jump and link, print string procedure, program flow will go to print string procedure to come here. After you are done, as a last statement, whenever the CPU sees this, it knows, oh, this guy wants me to go and execute the thing that follows the JAL that was evoked here. So what follows afterwards is another, lo and behold, another JAL exit procedure. So it's, it's like, a, more or less like specifying exactly how the sequence of instructions are going to be executed, really, which is, um... guys, are we all on the same page here? We're wrapping up this subject. Oh, well, I mean, uh, which, which part is not uh, very clear? I uh, know, I, I want to go and do, I want to go and do B, BICTs with education. I, th I think it's going to be Excel and Word. No. <laughs> no, but, but it turns out, right? I was going to, I was going to work. <laughs> It turns out when you understand what we're discussing, what we've been discussing, especially this part, if you understand this, you'll be able to write any type of programming or any type of program you wish to come up with. These are the fundamentals. When you understand this, you'll be able to better understand networking, how data is transmitted over the network. When you understand, not this, but when you understand what we're talking about here. It's the essence of computer architecture, right? You want to understand how this computer works. <laughs> But which part is not very clear here? 
Miss Banda, I, I saw her. How was EDU 1010? Yesterday, I saw you. Okay. What, what part is not very clear here? Yeah. Whatever happens, I think on Wednesday we, sh we need to have. Uh, let's finish off this garbage. Uh, on Wednesday we shall have hands on session. <coughs> Just to wrap up things here, guys, I mean, I want us to recap and then we want to do this, and who knows, maybe we can finish in good time to include lecture series number 23, which would be nice, right? into the test. Yes. Now just to just to just uh, something that in case people are wondering, you know, it so happens that there are other instructions. Not very important. We don't want to cover everything to do with MIPS here, but just glossing over this stuff here to mention that uh, there are other instructions that we haven't really talked about, uh, important instructions to do with loading um, or fetching data from memory and then writing data to memory, to RAM specifically, right? Um, I'll just suggest that you guys maybe just go and uh, do a bit of uh, research, won't be examinable really, uh, but just satisfy your curiosity, I guess, just go and look up what load weight and store weight does. I mean, we've seen what move does, just copying um, the value in the register to a different location, right? We know this is a um, pseudo instruction here. Um, but yeah, not very important. I just thought I'd mention that there are instructions specific to this, right? So. Um, what you what you you notice once you start going through examples is that there are certain instances where instead of what we've been doing, we can just say uh, just to show showcase what I'm talking about here. Uh, for the most part, uh, random. Uh, memory example or something. What we've been doing, right, is uh, when working with numbers, what we've been doing is we, we've deliberately been just specifying the numbers within the program itself, within the main label. But it turns out that you can do fuzzy things like one, two, three, four, var number one, uh, and then just say uh, word, and then just say 2019, for instance, and then var number two or something, uh, and then just word, and then just say four here. Just, I just want to show you like the examples of how this can be done. What we've, we were doing is uh, defining numbers within the main, but it turns out you can specify to say, um, I want to, to specify these numbers, could be double or 14 point numbers for instance, in memory, right? And then what you have to do to make use of those, those things that you've defined in memory is just like strings, you have to load them from memory, right? And because this is a word, how you use something like a load word is you just say load this into, uh, into register eight. Uh, just as an example here, this your, just to showcase how this works, I guess. And you notice that if I if I run if I run this program, I'll be able to see the the value that I've specified into. Uh, I'll be able to see it into register eight, right? I've just loaded it from RAM, right? You see this value here, 2019, right? I've, I've just loaded. You're just saying I want to load the number from memory, but but really. For you to be able to do that, you need to define the correct uh, data type. So if you're working with a floating point number, it would be like a float um, data type. If you're working with a double, if you're obsessing with double precision, you have to be a double, right? 64 bits instead of 32 bits. Um, so, but just to mention that this is something we, we're just skipping because we're not interested in how to program in, in assembly language, really. We're just trying to understand uh, how these instructions get to be specified. And then guys, just to, Recap what we've done, right? We are done now. To recap what we've done here. Um, we, we, we discussed this whole notion. We started a discussion for this particular part, a discussion with the different types of instructions. Fundamentally, MIPS has three types of instructions, R format, I format, J format. When you see code fragment like this, you must be able to tell us to say which one of these is R format and I format, right? You can clearly see I, you know, I, uh, R, R, I. Um, <clears throat> well, we've just seen J format here, jump and link, right? We discussed jump as well. Uh, we also, we also <coughs> discussed this whole notion of so-called pseudo instructions. Effectively, instructions that cannot be executed by the CPU, 
or rather instructions that have to be converted into a form that the CPU is able to execute, right? A whole bunch of them, right? Um, we first introduced the pseudo instructions, even though we didn't know that LI was a pseudo instruction, we discussed a LI load immediate. This is a pseudo instruction, right? Another pseudo instruction we have here is uh, the unconditional branch, right? As far as the CPU is concerned, CPU implemented using MIPS instruction set, there's no such thing as a B, uh, B right? BGT, no such thing as BGT, right? It has to be converted into equivalent bare instruction, um, right? So we should be able to, you know, kind of explain the differences between bare instructions and pseudo instructions here. Um, and then we, we discuss some, not all of them, some system calls, there are a lot of them, the system calls specific to working with files. For the most part, when you're writing computer programs, it's either you're manipulating files, right? Writing to a file, reading to a file or something. There are system calls for that. You, you, are, you might want to go and explore further to see how that works, but we just narrow down on the simpler ones, you know, how to print a string, how to read a, uh, an integer, how to um, print an integer, things of that nature. And I take away point was really how you go about requesting a specific service, a desired service. We also mentioned that typically, if this is in the exam, or in fact, if you're doing this in real life, you have access to reference material. Could be a table, could be documentation, reference documentation that specifies exactly how you go about using a particular system call, right? Um, straightforward here, really. You must know. If you want to gracefully exit, what do I do if I have a table? What must I do? If I want to print, what must I do, right? Turns out that you go through a different sequence of events. In certain instances, you must specify addresses. In certain instances, uh, you must r uh, read values into registers like V0, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So don't forget that. And then we discussed uh, you know, uh, program flow here. How do you divert program flow? You know, uh, we introduced this whole notion of Boolean expressions, really expressions that result into yes or no, or true or false, one or zero or something. And two main things we discussed in conditional branching and conditional branching, right? For conditional branching, you must have, typically you are, you're using, implicitly I guess, you're using a Boolean operator using two operands. The result is going to be true or false. PGT, dollar sign eight, comma dollar sign nine. That thing will either be true or false, or yes or no. BLT, SLT, right? All these things here. So it's fundamentally, it's, it's, it's a, what happens um, when that particular expression results or evaluates to true, and what happens if it results to false. In this particular example, what happens when this is not, when, in line number 22, when the value in 12 is not equal to the value in, I don't know if this is eight, we shall not branch to count even, right? So program flow. Uh, and then we finally, last week we had a discussion of uh, loops, they're going now. We had the discussion of loops where uh, we're saying there are instances when we want to do the same thing over and over again. Repetition, very key and important concept in programming and we're able to implement this, right? In MIPS, we're able to simulate what a computer does behind the scenes. You write your programming language in a high level, high level language and just say for the value, I iterate through this sequence of events, but behind the scenes there's a whole bunch of things that are happening as far as the computer is concerned, right? And really, the whole process involves nothing more than implement, implementation of loops Initialization of the values, <coughs> specification of the branch condition, <coughs> some processing that is involved, <coughs> modification of initial values, and then you branch, you repeat the loop. You can repeat the loop either using the pseudo instruction B, B followed by the label of the loop that you're executing, or if you want, J followed by the label itself. One and the same thing. Is this fine, guys? And then finally today, I mean, we talked about this, the importance of deduplicating code, really. Uh, just factor out common functionality. Yes, Andrew, and then. So it's possible that in fine, and procedures, then you move the whole thing. How do you mean? If you have, for example, a specific problem, then you're doing a different type of 
Yes. I don't know if I get your, your question here, but what you're saying is you implement a loop. Is it possible to use a procedure within the loop? Yes. So if in the procedure, if, if in the loop what you're doing is you're printing those natural numbers. Remember the example where we're printing natural numbers? Implement, not that it would make sense anyway, but implement a procedure that prints an integer. And then within the body of the loop, just say JL, the name of the procedure that prints the integer. You see, for you to understand this, besides practice, you want to form a mental picture of what's happening, especially when it comes to program flow here, right? Just reading won't help here, I'm sorry. But see, just form a mental picture of what's happening if you feed it actual numbers here. If start from the initial value, if this is zero, blah, 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 what's happening here, you know, what happens to the values in eight, and you know, when I loop the second time, what's happening? How many times am I going to loop? How many times am I going to loop? I don't know, right? How many times? You should be able to do this, right? Uh, is this? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, oh, sorry, I, 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 Mr. Mwepasa. I forgot. Hi. <laughs> you must call them today. So we've, we finished, mom and dad, or the guardian, we finished uh, MIPS instruction says today. <laughs> I don't think they'll understand. At some stage, I stopped telling my parents, I stopped giving them feedback because the stuff I started doing was way beyond them, which is fine in life, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> I was saying, my, I used to, to tell my parents to say, oh, we are covering this, you know, in, in C, C102, in M111 or M101, I can't remember the codes. This is what we are doing, but at some stage, right? You start doing things that don't, doesn't even make sense for you to send the script to them unless if there's a grade or something. My father used to like those things, but as I'm saying, he said, no, right? Yes, my father. Sorry? Yes. The label. The loop label. Yes. Okay, because on slide 22, right, I see that so that that particular definition is is more applicable to um, high level programming languages so in high level programming languages you'd have uh, four loops you have the while loop you have the do while loop right but at this level really um, you can pretty much implement a for loop using the same process we followed what he's asking there's a slide where I said uh, uh, you typically use a, a while loop when you don't know how many times you want to iterate. There are certain instances when you don't know. I gave you an example, I don't know how many people have bothered to do this, I said write a program that prompts a user to enter an unlimited number of integers and then you just sum up. You don't know how many integers the user wants to add. It could be 100, it could be two, it could be one, not one, but two, 100, 1,000 numbers. You don't know, what do you use? While loop. But if you know, if you say write a program that takes in 10 numbers, you know that you're going to work with 10 numbers. What do you use? A for loop. And what a for loop does really is specify uh, the end, and it's part of the for loop, say end when, when this particular condition is specified. So that's what I mean. But, but for, for really for MIPS, no, it doesn't matter. Guys, yeah, done. I think we still have time to cover lecture series number 23. I don't know if there are any questions. What I'm Prepare on Wednesday, I hope it works out, the lab. I'll go there tomorrow to make sure things are working. We shall do a bit of hands-on to consolidate these things. Please, if you don't understand what we've been talking about, make time and attend because this content is going to be in the test. The reason why I'm, I'm going to extra mile here to say we're going to do this on Wednesday, possibly Friday as well, is because I want to make sure we're on the same page before, on or before October 11th, D-Day, right? Normandy is happening here. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Are, are those notes? Wow. I, I admire you. I, uh, seriously, I do. I struggle to write now because I, I don't write off. In fact, I shake when I'm writing because I, I can't even remember the last time I wrote things down. Maybe when signing, I shake, seriously. It's even painful because 
The world has changed, right? You, you don't. No, no, seriously. If I, if I were you and I had a, a computer or, or a phone, I'd be taking notes using my computer, right? Just typing notes, right? Or, or just, uh, just if, if, the, if your lecturer obsesses a lot about being or recording, you just record the lecture. Put the thing and record it, right? Watch it at two times speed or something. Guys, I'll see you when you see me, which is Wednesday. But I'll stick around brief for a few minutes in case people have questions. Thanks a lot. See you. Yes. When can I see you before Friday? Before Friday? Yes. For the... For the cutest place. Thursday. What time? Hi. Hey, hi. This, this, not J R J A L. J R. J A L. No, J R. Oh, J R. Okay. You jump and then go back to the jump and then. You go back. You go to the instruction that follows the invocation of that thing. But what if you're doing the last one? If you're doing the what? Oh, if, if you're doing the last instruction, then then that then if you're doing the last instruction, then the last thing to execute is that particular procedure. Good question. It's that particular procedure. So you write again, J R and the register. Okay, just wait. Let me see my calendar from this thing, and then let's look at what you're saying. You're not busy, are you? Just two min three minutes. Come on Thursday. There's something wrong with my. Okay, so. Th there's a half time here and then come on come on Thursday between any time between uh well are you do you have time on Thursday? What time do you have? No, after nine. After nine? Why are you not having a lot of people? Did he come with it? Okay, after nine I'm gonna do it. Uh uh, be expecting that in May. Okay. Um, yeah, so your question was? Oh, sorry. Sure. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No, I just wanted to ask. Since some of my kids are here zero, and I do not have the people ones, I only have them on my phone. So can I come? To you? Yes. In, in fact, we like people that have them on their phone. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Thank you for being proactive. You lost the physical copies, right? Yes, I lost. Are you not oh, glad you made backup copies? Yes, I just got the mom to send me the other Sorry? Because I picked up my phone got destroyed, so I had to back up on my mother's phone. Oh, yes. why can't you back them up to the cloud? Google. But now it's by then. Or Dropbox. Thank you, sir. All right. I'm trying to be the one. So I can come on Thursday as well, or Friday? Uh, oh, yeah, that would be good. Okay. You can kill two bears with one stuff. Yes. So like that one, the instruction that you were doing. Which instruction? The one that you were showing, yeah. For example. Yeah. Here or where? For example, here. It mm -hmm. says, when you write, um, when you write this one, mm -hmm. meaning you have to go back to whatever comes after this. Yes. Right? 
Now, I was asking, even on the exit one, you wrote the same thing. The, the one that has got the egg. Yeah. yeah. Maybe let's look at the actual program called which this one here. Yeah. So you said that when you use this one, meaning you have to go back to this one. Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly. If there's nothing there. Yes. For example, if pretend that there's nothing. Well then nothing will happen. It's like you you've stopped. And typically, right? For this this program called Yeah. 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 Ye
you should start saying 8 to 10. How sure are you that everyone in here is going to be available 8 to 10? In fact, I'm not available 8 to 10 because my office hours are not just for this course, there are other courses that I teach. So people expect me to be around between that period. Yeah. Ideally though, Sunday will be good. We like Sunday after people pray, right? Do you pray? Okay. After those that pray, pray. Hi. Sorry? Fridays. What about Fridays? That's when I go to mosque. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're like um, Master, Master Piri there. Okay. Is there a mosque close by or you go across the road? Eh? No, I go. Where is home? You live home? Why do you have to go there? Don't the people pray? Isn't there a mosque? Okay. Alright. Are you okay though? Are you okay? You're sweating. Is it, is it, are you fine? Are you sick? Why are we talking about Sarah? Are you 